In September of 1993, I was fortunate enough to conduct an interview with Francis O'Brien, the Dean of Antiquarian Books in Northern New England. Francis is now 85 years old. He was born in Portland in 1908 of Irish parents, his first Irish generation having arrived from County Galway in the 1840s was Barney Daly. In this interview, we walk with Francis through some of his early memories of Portland neighborhoods, his early experiences with Portland schools, and eventually we travel with him around the world on some of his world trips, including a trip to Ireland in the winter of 1931 through 1932, in which, at which time he met the president of Ireland, Eamon de Valera. We conclude this interview with reflections on life today. And I believe that this will show you that Francis O'Brien is more than simply a book dealer, but really a lover of life and a lover of ideas. Join me and enjoy with me this interview with one of Portland's true intellectuals, Francis O'Brien. Well, I was born in 1908 on Sheridan Street. And uh, I think we lived there for two or three years, and then I, my family moved down to Montgomery Street, which is just below Washington Avenue. And uh, we lived there until I was about six years old, and then we moved out to Ocean Avenue, right near the corner of uh, Washington Avenue, known then and now as Lunt's Corner. So we lived, I lived there until I was, uh, well, I went to the Cummings School, which is nearby, and, uh, but I spent a great deal of time in Portland as I had uh, relatives living in, in uh, Portland and was uh, constantly going back and forth. And in those days, of course, uh, although we had the trolley cars, we had the big belt line, which went out Washington Avenue and around Allen's Corner and back in town. We had the little belt line, which went uh, out Washington Avenue and over Ocean Avenue to Woodford's and then back in town. Uh, for the most part, kids uh, would think nothing of walking into town. And it was only a, maybe a mile and a half or two miles into the city. And uh, we'd uh, just go across Tookie's Bridge and then make our way down to the center of, uh, center of town. Uh, things were, uh, I think on the whole, life was rather uh, quiet as compared to today. There were no automobiles to speak of. Uh, uh, during the summertime, uh, most of the boys as they grew up would uh, uh, go out to the country club and caddy. And uh, in the winter time, of course, we all enjoyed uh, uh, winter sports. We had very primitive skis in those days, as I remember it. In fact, most of the skis, as I remember them, were homemade, made out of barrel staves and that sort of thing. And it was quite a thrill to see the uh, older boys uh, when they emerged with uh, uh, the Paris Manufacturing Company skis, which are very much like ours today. So that my growing up, I think, was more or less normal. We, uh, uh, to project a little into the future, I, I think we had things like Boy Scouts. I belong to the Boy Scouts, the old Washington Avenue Methodist Church. and. Uh, Although uh, I was I'm not a, I was brought up as a Catholic and went to the went to St. Joseph's Church over in uh, on uh, Stevens Avenue, but at the same time we had uh, the the few Catholic boys in the neighborhood all were very welcome at the Methodist Church where we had a Boy Scout troop, and uh, although there was some protest on the part of our parish priest about going to this. Uh, uh, Methodist Church, using this Methodist Church, I, I think most of our parents agreed that it was perfectly all right to do so. so was there any fear at all, Francis, about proselytizing? At, at uh, the time? Well, I think this is the attitude of uh, old Father Holohan at, uh, uh, at St. Joseph's. I think he thought that, uh, you know, we were in possible uh, fear of damnation by going to this Protestant church. but. Uh, we never had that feeling about it, and we were perfectly, perfectly uh, at, at home there. Do you and, think uh, that that sense of uh, proselytization came over with, with the, uh, the church from Ireland? Well, I think it was general. I think it was general in those days. Uh, you know, in, 
in a, in a sense, we was it's still a uh, uh, a minority people, and uh, in many cases, I think the people of Irish descent in Portland were still treated like a minority, and uh, we always felt at home in what was virtually an Irish ward, Ward Two. It seemed to be our own ward, and uh, that was where my parents. Uh, were brought up, and my grandfather and grand great grandfathers lived, and uh, so we always felt on safe territory there in Ward Two. This is a very stupid way of looking at things, but as I remember, uh, there were some vestiges of that in the past. It seems yeah. strange to think of that now, but I, I'm sure that just uh, 70 or 80 years ago, that's the way that most people would have felt about. That's exactly the way they felt. Safety is a very important issue even yeah. today. Yeah. Well, um, could we talk about your uh, parents and your grandparents a little bit, Francis? How far back into to Portland did they go? Well, my the I, my first ancestor came to Portland in uh, uh, 1840, and he was a man named uh, 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 Bernard Daly. He was later quite well known as Barney Daly, and he was about 25 years old when he came here. He came from County Galway in Ireland, and uh, he. Uh, apparently came by way of Liverpool because I know his eldest son, Peter, uh, was born in Liverpool on the way to America. And uh, he was married to, his, his wife's name was Nee, N-double-E, -E, Bridget Nee. And uh, uh, I don't know exactly how Bonnie got started, but he became a fairly active businessman in Portland. He was engaged in a lot of things. He was an undertaker at a time when the, the Irish were, uh, because of some of the diseases they brought with them, tuberculosis and so forth, were dying off like mad. And so much so that the Western Cemetery has mass graves of Irish, and uh, they're not always sure who the names of those people were. But eventually, he, uh, he became a builder. He uh, managed to build houses on the, at the foot of the hill. He owned some land up there. And uh, his own house was on Cumberland Avenue. And uh, I, I'm not sure about his real estate holdings, but I know he, he built an apartment house of sorts over on uh, uh, Congress Street, which is still there. I mean, it was rebuilt, I think, in 1900. But the original dates of 1866 and uh, uh, 1900 are on the front of the building. So. That's the building called the Daily Block yeah, even today? Yeah, right. And, uh, but somewhere along the line, uh, he was a shrewd individual and apparently with a great demand for uh, rough labor, uh, he enlisted uh, a number of uh, these Irish immigrants uh, on, to work on the railroads. They were building the railroads at that time, 1850 or so. Uh, the factories, the factories in Lewiston and Auburn and uh, Bitterford and so forth, and I know he sort of organized the labor for a lot of those. And then, in the meantime, he had uh, uh, he had uh, he owned a, a small mail packet, which ran between here and St. John, New Brunswick. And he brought a, gr a great many Irish immigrants back to Portland from uh, St. John. And uh, and then in 1869, uh, when they built the Portland Ogdensburg Railroad, which we call the Mountain Division of the Main Central. Uh, he had the contract for supplying all the labor for that, and uh, almost all Irish. And uh, it's sort of funny that the Irish uh, laborers, a great many of them were, I think, either hurt or even killed during the uh, that uh, process of going up through the mountains, of uh, clearing the uh, uh, a lot of the land to get through, leveled, leveling the land and so forth. And I know I, I have seen a telegram that was sent by uh, uh, one of the uh, overseers on the construction job to, a, uh, to the superintendent of the road, and which has said, had an accident last night, not much damage, only an Irishman was killed. <laughs> only one Irishman was killed. Francis next goes on to reminisce about his experiences with school 
at which time he said, I was very interested in history and I found the library for the first time. So anyway, I, I, at that time I went to the uh, Catholic Institute on Free Street where the, where the uh, Blue Cross has been in recent years. And uh, that was, uh, uh, I think, called the Catholic Institute up to about 1920, possibly 21 or 22. And then the, and uh, it also included Catholic High School. And of course, that was the foundation of what is now Chevrolet, Chevrolet High School. So I, uh, as I say, I, I spent a year there in the, I think it was the sixth grade. And at the end of that year, we, my wife, my mother recovered from her illness, so we went back to living out on, uh, on Ocean Avenue. And from, well, from uh, when I graduated from, from uh, coming school, I went to, the, I went to the Catholic high school for, a year, and then transferred to Portland High School, where I eventually graduated, 1926. What were your memories of uh, Portland High School back then? Did you did you have a sense of it being the Second oldest high school in the country. Well, I don't. I, I, although I was, uh, I was very much interested in history, uh, and I think during the year that I spent with my aunt on State Street, I found the public library for the first time, and uh, I uh, it was the old public library, of course, and uh, uh, I got to. Uh, I'd always been interested in books, even as a kid. My mother had quite a few books, and I. My aunt on State Street had a great many books because uh, uh, her son was a uh, medical doctor and uh, he was a well-educated man and had many books in the house. So I think I got very much interested in books at that time. And uh, I, uh, uh, the women who were in charge of the public library uh, in that, at that period were very fine uh, librarians and very welcoming, and the woman, particularly uh, Miss Haggard in the children's room, was wonderful to me. And I got to I really love that woman and remember her the rest of my life and saw her right down to the time she died. What kind but, of reading would you have been doing back then? Do you remember any of the books? Well, uh, I, I got very much interested in historical novels, historical books for boys, and uh, that was a great period of. Uh, uh, books dealing <clears throat> with the Revolution, with the uh, Fr French and Indian Wars, the Civil War, and so forth. And I think most boys that did any great amount of reading uh, uh, sort of uh, gravitated to the same general books. Uh, there were uh, just an incredible number of wonderful boys' authors in those days, and some and girls' authors as well, because I think we read girls' books as well as we did boys' books. And uh, uh, I can think of, uh, uh, for instance, on a local, on a local uh, uh, thing, uh, we had Elijah Kellogg, who wrote books about Casco Bay. And uh, these were mostly set back in the 1830s and 40s. And they had to do with shipbuilding and boat building and uh, all the things that uh, had to do with uh, with sailing around the bay. He made and some references in some of his books, did he not, to the uh, black stevedores that were along the waterfront yes, at the he, time? Yes, he did. And uh, apparently the, the uh, uh, in revolutionary times and later, uh, a lot of the stevedoring work on the waterfront was done by, by blacks. And we had a fair number of blacks here in Portland. <clears throat> they had their own church, you know, down on what they used to call the Bight down on Federal Street, where the, where the back of the cemetery, the Eastern Cemetery, sort of rounds around. And the old timers in Portland used to refer to that as the Bight. Down by Hancock and uh, Yeah, Hancock and uh, Federal Street and uh, Mumford Street and so forth. Uh, the, uh, oddly enough, the blacks more or less lost out when the Irish came, because the Irish were so eager to work that they probably worked for less money than the uh, than the blacks did, and at least that seems to be the legend. And uh, a lot of the blacks left here and went to Boston and other places, from what I understand. 
Francis was also very interested in travel. His travel included trips to Great Britain, France, Germany, and in 1932, in the midst of the Depression, a trip with Connie to Ireland. I wanted to go to Europe. I wanted to go to Europe, and I think I worked part of a year in a garage as a night man to save money to go to Europe. And when I had gotten about $1,000 together, I uh, got a job on a freighter that was going to Manchester, England. And uh, when I got there, I, I jumped the ship, which actually was illegal, but I apparently got away with it, and uh, made my way. I, had, I did have passports for both uh, England and uh, France and Germany, and uh, so I made my way to, uh, through London to uh, Trying to think of the, uh, it wasn't Dover. Uh, Southampton, perhaps? No, it wasn't Southampton. It was on a ch one of the channel ports. Um, mm. Well, at any rate, I got to France. I, I managed to get to France and uh, eventually to Paris. And uh, I, I stayed in Paris for uh, several months and attended the uh, uh, Alliance Francaise, the, the French. Uh, school to learn French and uh, enjoyed life there. Uh, I had a very inexpensive room on the Rue Bonaparte which is near the, uh, well on the west on the west bank of Paris and uh, and then I wanted to I wanted to go to a summer session of the uh, University of Heidelberg in Germany so I bought a bicycle and took a trip up through uh, northern France into uh, Belgium and over into Germany, and then I spent some time in Bonn, city of Bonn. I met some people there and had uh, quite an interesting time. And then from there, I went to Heidelberg and uh, spent part of the summer there. This, I think it was a, a six-week course. Now, what year and would that have been, Francis? Uh, 1929. 1929. And uh, eventually, uh, when it was time for me to go home, I uh, went back to England, and uh, I, I uh, had I was broke by this time. I didn't want to get in touch with my folks, so I uh, I went to North, I went to Southampton, and knowing that, uh, of course, the Leviathan and some of the other big ships of that time uh, sailed from Southampton, and. Uh, and having Siemens papers, I had no no trouble at all. Had to wait, I think, almost a month to get a ship, but I did get a job on the Leviathan, so I came home to New York and came home to Portland. And uh, now, during the time that I was over there, I had I was asked by the editor of the Telegram to write a series of uh, travel letters, which I did, which were published on the Telegram. And uh, so this gave me an idea of. Be you know, getting into the newspaper business. Did you ever go back and reread those letters years after? Yeah, yeah. How did you do? Well, not bad for someone who was semi-educated. I mean, I, you know, just out of high school, and I just, uh, not too bad, actually, I guess. I've been told that anyway. In the winter of 1931 through 1932, Francis and Connie traveled to Ireland. While there, they witnessed a young politician by the name of Eamon de Valera, future president of Ireland. And uh, so the following spring, we came home <coughs> to Portland. And uh, I went to work for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company as a collector. <coughs> and uh, uh, that was not a particularly pleasant kind of work, but I, I put in several, quite a few months at it. and. Uh, had a sort of a rare piece of luck in that I, by more or less by accident, I sold a very uh, large uh, uh, sort of a, 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 an annuity to an old lady that uh, had up to that point been living 
uh, in Squala, but who had money and plenty of money, but she was afraid to spend it because this was really in the heart of the Depression. This was 1931. And uh, eventually she, uh, with some friends advising her, she decided to buy this annuity, which was $50,000. And uh, I got a, uh, a very good commission out of it, enough so that my wife and I uh, left Portland in December of that year on a freighter and went to Ireland. And we were over there from uh, December to, well, the following spring. And uh, Let's talk a little bit about your, your memories of Ireland then yeah. at that time. This would have been around 1932? 30, uh, yes, it was 30. We, we went over there the latter part of 31 and came back in the spring of 32. And now that yeah. would have been just about the time that Eamon de Valera was coming into uh, power. Well, we were... We were we were living in a small town in the west of Ireland uh, called Killaloo, which is on Loch Derg, and it was the area that I was uh, particularly interested in because this was uh, County Clare, and uh, I was somewhat interested in the history of my own family, of the O'Briens, and that was the part of Ireland that they came from. And uh, uh, managed to touch base at all the historic spots that uh, we could get around to because we had no car in those days it was all by foot and uh, but we had uh, it was not a comfortable time for us we lived we hired a house on the green at Killaloo and uh, we had to heat it ourselves and that was quite a struggle but uh, but on the whole I think we did enjoy it and uh, but I didn't accomplish what I wanted to do. I was I went over there to do research and also that I thought I was going to do some writing, but I never got very much of it done. And eventually, when our, uh, money ran out, we came home. But uh, we had spent some time in Dublin. I liked Dublin very much. And we lived in a uh, place called the American Flats on Upper Pembroke Street and uh, actually lived in what had been the servants' quarters in the, uh, in the back uh, where the stables were and so forth. They converted this into a, a small, very small rooms and apartments. And uh, so that I spent a fair, fair amount of time in the National Museum, National Library. And each day we would sort of map out the days, what to do, and uh, always in the middle of the afternoon we'd go to a uh, We'd go to a, a small tea room called, the, I think it was called the Cloth of Gold. No, not the Cloth of Gold. That may not have been the exact name. But anyway, we, we would have tea and scones and that sort of thing. And it was a place where they also sold tweeds. And uh, I remember my, my wife buying uh, enough tweeds to have some co coats and suits made. And uh, how, were you ex how were you received at that time as an Irish-American? in Ireland? Well, of course, uh, I don't think it made much difference in, du in Dublin, but in, uh, in County Clare, uh, there was still great division from the days of the Troubles, and uh, there were families that were split right down the middle, and uh, we were, I was, of course, uh, politically, I was very much uh, in favor of De Valera and the Republicans, when I, you know, read about Irish history and so forth. But, uh, so that I sometimes found myself in trouble by making uh, wrong remarks at the wrong time. And I could see what, uh, what cleavage there was, you know, among, some, sometimes in the, very, in the same family, you know, brother against brother and so forth. This would and, have been the time of the anti-treaty and the pro-treaty division. Right, yeah. And de Valera's forces would have come out against the treaty at that well, time. Well, it so happened, it so happened that while we were in Killaloo, uh, it was during the election in the spring of 1930. Uh, no, it was in the winter of 1932. And uh, De Valera came to Killaloo. Uh, in fact, he came from, I think, from the direction of Galway, came down along Loch Derg. Uh, and uh, I can remember the instead of driving in his car up over the hill, some of the men from the hills had gone down and attached ropes to the car 
and there were probably 20 or 30 men that pulled that car uh, up over the hill to the square, uh, the cent cent center of the square in Killaloo, where they had a platform. And uh, so that we stood right at the platform and listened to De Valera make his speech. And he had a very sinister looking woman uh, who was a secretary, all dressed in black, looked like a witch, who all, was always with him, you know, handing him uh, paper and papers and that sort of thing. But uh, very, very impressive speaker. Of course, he won, won the election. And once he got in in 1932, he was in for pretty much the next uh, 40 years? Probably the rest of his life. Yes. Yeah, yeah. As well as prime, as prime minister and as, as president. Francis spent a great deal of his life working with books, including his early years with A.J. Houston, bookseller. This resulted in his receiving an honorary Doctor of Literature award from Bowdoin College. What kind of books, Francis, did you specialize in? What were the, the kind of books that you would have gone after yourself when you were procuring books? Well, it was the whole range of books, actually. There was nothing that was foreign to me. I, uh, every type of book, actually, that uh, that uh, was ever printed was, in, was within my ken, uh, but I was particularly interested in Americana, that is, books dealing with American history, and uh, also uh, uh, reference books, uh, bibliography, and that sort of thing, that uh, any bookseller should have, uh, you know, as a basis of his doing business. and. Uh, Main books were anything dealing with the state of Maine was very important, and uh, but I was also very much interested in general literature of uh, uh, all times and all languages. Although I'm not familiar with many languages, but I was particularly interested in some French and German books, uh, with a very imperfect knowledge of those languages, but. Uh, so that's been the basis of most of my business. What about your Irish collection, Francis? I well, that was a hobby. That's, that was more or less of a hobby. And I have, uh, I guess, from the time I was very young, put together a fairly large number of books dealing with Irish literature and Irish history and Irish language and so forth. And uh, so that today I have a fairly large collection of those things, which I am proposing to give to Bowdoin College. Speaking of uh, Bowdoin College, uh, you recently were given an, uh, an honorary degree at Bowdoin College. Uh, Doctor of Literature. Yes. Yeah. What, what, what did that feel like after all of this? Well, it's of work? for anyone who hadn't done all that well in high school, I think it was somewhat of a surprise to me that I, that, uh, I received a degree of that magnitude. So naturally, I was rather pleased with it.